hi welcome to the signal pad in this episode i have another repair for you guys another ebay find and this is a techtronics a tech vpi type probe no you're not having a deja vu the last time i fixed one of those probes was actually a different one but slightly different model number but it does make a big difference in the usability of these probes so the one i repaired before was a 200 model which is a one and a half kilovolt probe but it goes to 200 megahertz this is a 100 one and it goes to 100 megahertz but it goes to six kilovolts so the ability to measure very high voltages is valuable in some experiments that i want to do and that's why i went after this one also on ebay now this has a similar problem in terms of how it is manifesting itself the scope just doesn't detect it i wonder if it's just a firmware issue or not but we can simply try it out and see if if that's the issue as our first step. So I was about to try and re-upload the firmware like we did with the 200 version of this probe but then I realized that the body of the probe would get rather warm when I plug it into the oscilloscope and the 200 version wasn't doing that. So I opened the main body and this is what it looks like on the inside. Now this instrument, this particular one, handles twice the voltage, 6000 volt peak compared to the 200 series and as a result the high voltage part is actually fully potted. You can see there's obviously a mold in there where they inject this around it and of course putting epoxy or molding anything around that increases the breakdown capability of those junctions allowing it to handle a much higher voltage now the rest is essentially exactly the same you have some voltage dividers and everything and the rest of the probe is basically replicating the same thing as the other model now i feel this part of it gets really warm so i say let's take out the thermal camera take a look at it when it's plugged in and see if we can locate it all right let's take a look using the live view of the flare camera here and indeed, there is a big hot spot there. Let's go ahead. This thing auto auto focuses here. Ooh, yeah. There's a bunch of resistors there. They are at a hundred degrees Celsius sometimes. Yeah, that's pretty bad. Okay, so there's almost like a short circuit somewhere, and there is pretty hot spot on this side too. Yeah, there's definitely something going on. So I think we have a short circuit somewhere on this, which explains it. That's probably why it doesn't detect anything because this likely doesn't have a power supply. So let's go back to the visual range here, take a look and see what those resistors are and if we can identify what could have gone wrong with it. So looking at the board, these are the resistors that were getting extremely hot. Now on the other side, there's also a few more resistors, it's hard to see, but they're right underneath, there it is, right underneath the cable that comes in. Now looking at a little bit at the traces, it looks like these resistors are in series with the voltage input of this voltage regulator. Now, I suspect they may be for some protection, perhaps for situations just like this, so that you can't short circuit the power supply on the other side of this instrument, because there's also some, you know, some circuitry in this, and then of course the power supply inside the oscilloscope has to be protected. That's my guess. I just had a very brief look at it, but I suspect that's the issue, and what I wonder what happens if we remove this, if that problem goes away, or if we can measure a short circuit around here. Let's try that out. Okay, let's do some measurements. It's plugged in again. Again, it's been plugged in for a very long time, so it really doesn't matter if I plug it in any longer than this. But uh, so we have here a voltage regulator. This is an LM317. And I can measure the voltage on one side of these resistors. And that's 5.2 volts. And on the other side, 2.3. Now, these are tiny resistors. I think they're only 20 ohms or something. And this is the input to the regulator. And the output to the regulator, you can see, is only half a volt. So indeed, there is not enough, this either not regulating or there's a short circuit somewhere, but definitely there is no voltage. So there's no 5 volt supply on this. And of course, that means that the processor on the other side cannot ever respond to the other host. And that's why it doesn't work. So let's go and unplug it. I'm going to unplug it from the scope. Let's measure the resistance across that capacitor. Let's see what we get. For example, on this side, if I measure that, 1.7 kilo ohm is fine and on this side measure this yeah 4 ohms so if this is supposed to be a 5 volt supply for example even a 3.3 volt supply 4 ohms cannot be right I'm going to swap these leads as well make sure it's symmetric yeah it's the same on both sides so either this is shorted or something else on the board is shorted bringing it down let's start one thing at a time let's try removing the LM317 and see if it resolves all of this and whether this still remains a short circuit and then I have a few other things we can try okay so the LM317 is gone as you can see and we can measure the resistance across the capacitor that used to be at its output over here and yep it is still 4 ohms so that wasn't the problem and it kind of makes sense that 4 ohm was probably pulling down the output of that regulator causing this issue I'm going to pl plug the probe back in of course it's still not going to work it allows us to measure the voltage to see if those voltages are now okay because I expect no drop across those resistors anymore. We can try that. So now 
there you go now it's 11 11 volts basically it should be 12 volts or so it makes sense it was basically shorting and i think those resistors on the other side are probably in series with these and that's why that there was extra drop there and on the other side of these resistors I read exactly the same voltage, which means the current through the resistors is zero, and that's because this is gone. So this regulator may still be okay, but now we have to find a short, and we can use a couple of tricks for that. So here I have soldered two wires across the capacitor that was showing me the 4 ohms, and we're going to inject our own voltage across it. Now assume that there is 4 ohms of resistance there, and it stays linear. If I put 1 volt on it, I'm going to draw 250 milliamp. That's quarter of a watt. We should be able to very easily detect that with a thermal camera, and some of those components are going to light up because they're getting hotter and there must be a short in them. Now one volt is not going to damage anything in any case because most of the semiconductors on this board are going to have easily mo much more than one volt of uh, breakdown on them. So that should be not a problem. We're going to use here the Keysight power supply. Well, here we go with one volt on there. We have indeed one hot component and only one. This is on the other side of the board and we'll take a look at it in just a second. There's nothing else formed. That's just the back, of, back side of the same component. Well, at least that's only one thing. So we're going to have to take a look, and I think that's just a processor. So we might have to change that. Well, here's a shorted component. That's the main processor, so we're going to have to change that. No wonder it doesn't respond, doesn't work, because there's no communication between the probe head. So ironically, it's actually a similar problem to the old probe, but in a very different way. I have to take that component off. I actually have purchased replacements, because when I was repairing the last one, I thought that might be the problem. So we should be able to take this off, put a new one in there. But before I do that, once I remove this, I want to put the... LM317 back here to make sure the power supply is correct because it could have been that this died and then of course killed the other component so we do it one step at a time. So I went ahead and I put the voltage regulator back and it's plugged into the scope. If I were to measure it you can see that we get our 5 volts back which means that that voltage regulator was fine the whole time that wasn't the issue. Now the other thing I did is I went back after I removed the processor and I measured every single one of those pins to make sure there is no high voltage present on it because there are higher voltages on this board 12 volts 15 volts and it could have been that there is somehow a problem putting those voltages on those pins and that could have killed the processor. So now that I see no issue at all I'm confident to put that processor back on so that we can perhaps program it. So the microprocessor has been placed and reprogrammed like I did last time and some things did indeed improve so when I now plug this into the scope I can hear the relays click. Essentially this probe head goes through some kind of a self-test to ensure that the levels are correct but it doesn't pass the self-test. So on there we still have an error that says critical accessory fault and it doesn't work which means there must be something else going on. But the fact that we actually have a communication this is already a huge improvement so now we have to dig around the analog circuitry and see why it is failing self-test. Now, as to be expected, the front end of this probe is going to have some op-amps in it, and those op-amps are going to have plus and minus power supply, so that's a good place to start, typically to make sure that we do have the symmetric power supply to the op-amps. Now, not all op-amps need a plus and minus power supply. Some of them can operate from a single supply, but these ones should have plus and minus. So I'm going to go ahead and measure that. So I think on this side we have the positive power supply in one of these op-amps, and we see 9 volts. It's a little bit of strange voltage, but it is there positive and I will go to the other side I see 0.9 volts. Now that should be a negative power supply and even if this was a single power supply it should at least be zero so I, I suspect it should be negative. Now I turn this around on the other side and on this side there's a whole bunch of DC-DC converters which you probably saw when we were looking at the zoomed in view of it. Now digging in there I see a linear component over here and this is actually either a plus or a minus power supply chipset. It's the switching power supply so let's zoom in a little bit more. And no matter how much I measure around this area, around the inductor and the decoupling capacitor, I never see anything negative. In fact, I do see that 0.9 volt supply in a couple of these places. So I suspect that this DC-DC converter isn't doing anything. So maybe that's a good thing to also replace. I don't think it has any activity. Let's give that a try. Okay, so I went and changed that, and the power supply actually now works, but the probe still doesn't work. There's something else still wrong there. Now I came to the conclusion after doing a couple of checks that that clicking noise of the relay switching doesn't necessarily mean there is a communication between the probe head and the probe body. That could just be the start of sequence of the microcontroller that I replaced on the probe body. So I said, let's take a look at the head now. Now the head also has a microprocessor, which I changed and played around with in the last probe I repaired. But there's a communication, obviously, that has to happen. Now that works because I can read the chip ID and everything. I can actually download the firmware from the probe head. But then I went ahead and look at the interface over here. There's two resistors. Now this resistor over here is labeled as 01X, which is a code for a 10 ohm resistor. And when I measure, measure that resistor, the resistor actually measures 50 kilo ohm. So could that resistor be damaged? And the reason I started looking there was there were so many things that had happened to the probe body. 
maybe some high voltage event, maybe something wrong with the interface that this was plugged into, and maybe that damaged the probe body and it could have damaged these resistors, actually burned them out because there was so much current that potentially could have flown. So that's my guess right now. Let's go ahead and change that resistor. Either way, it shouldn't be that high. Let's see if that changes anything. Okay, I changed the resistor from a spare board that I had, so let's see what happens, and if it doesn't work, it's going to be thrown out the window. So here I have the probe powered from an external power supply, just so we can make sure that that DC-DC converter is actually working, and Pooch is walking around making sure everything's okay. So here is our negative supply after the converter has been changed. There it is, you can see the negative supply is now there, and the positive supply is also there. So that works now. Now I also changed the resistor as I showed you in the remote head itself. Let's plug it into the scope and see what happens. And check it out. Finally, this probe is actually now correctly detected and it seems to be working. Now we should just zero it and do a quick cal measurement on it to make sure that it is actually functional all the way from the inputs to the probe head. So I performed a very crude calibration. I used a high voltage function generator here that can go up to a couple of hundred volts and it allows me to put in a precise, let's say, 100 volt RMS signal and then measure it with a probe. There are two potentiometers on here which you can adjust the gains of the two settings and you just want that measurement to agree with the multimeter up there. So the multimeter is measuring RMS voltage over here, the scope can calculate the RMS voltage and then from that we can adjust it until we get the right value. And you can see how close the value is, this is in the 600 volt range and the 6 kilovolt range, you can see it's almost exactly the same. You can tune it a little bit more to get it a bit closer if you want, but this is good enough. Now let's see if we can generate some really high voltages to push the probe to its limit. So let's go ahead and use this associated research iPod tester. Now these devices are used to essentially stress test various components at very high voltages to make sure that they pass various safety parameters. Now this thing can actually go to 6 kilovolts RMS, which is almost 17 kilovolt peak to peak. Now we don't want to do that because this probe is only rated for 6 kilovolt. But at 2.12 kilovolt RMS, which is what it is set to right now, we're essentially at exactly 6 kilovolts. So let's go ahead and try it out and see what happens. I've set this to basically continuously apply 2 kilovolts for about 30 seconds, and we can see if the scope measures that correctly. All right, here goes nothing. I'm going to press the test button here. And there it is, check it out. I don't know if you can read these numbers or not, but it's reporting 2.114 kilovolt RMS, six kilovolts peak to peak at 60 hertz, which is exactly what it should be. And it seems to be working just fine. And the calibration is okay. That waveform isn't completely sinusoidal, but we can do a whole bunch of that analysis. That I think is just coming from the associated research uh, tester there, it's not from the probe itself. And the probe is actually finally functional. This was a lot of problems for this probe. I spent a good couple of hours debugging this and to figure out all these unique problems that it had. But finally it is repaired and we can add it to the collection. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know what you think in the comment section. I'm working on a review that's taking a little bit longer than usual, but I think it's quite exciting. So I'll see you next time.